What's up? It's Andy Grammer with Jag. Hi, this is Carly Rae Jepsen, and you're listening to Jag. Hey, everybody. It's Joe Jonas hanging with Jag. This is Heather Knox with the hottest Jag I've ever seen. Ryan Seacrest with Jag. It's B.O.B. checking in with my homie Jag. So much swag with my homie Jag. It's the Jag Show podcast. So I went to my first podcast movement in 2018 in Philadelphia, not knowing what to expect. I was brand new to podcasting. And one of the first people I heard from was today's guest. Carrie Caulfield Eric runs Yaya Podcasting in Delaware. She's a podcast editor, coach, consultant, and so much more. And she also runs the Just Busters Facebook group for female podcast editors. Welcome, Carrie. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, John. And I have to say that was like the coolest intro ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a, a little nod to my background in radio. So, you know, as I said in the intro, I walked into Philadelphia two years ago not knowing what to expect, not knowing anybody. You were one of the first people that I saw speak and also that uh, I had a conversation with just as I was getting my feet wet with podcasting. So one of the first people that I got to know in the space and look at everything that you've been doing then and since, it's amazing. So let me first start and ask you your background and how you got involved with podcasting in the first place. So I started podcasting in 2014. Mm -hmm. I was a podcast listener. I had a favorite podcast that was about scrapbooking, of all things. Okay. And that podcast retired. And one of my girlfriends said, you know what, Carrie, you should do a podcast. And I guess maybe because I was opinionated. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And my reaction was yes. So (laughs) without a lot of thought about it. So I basically spent six months planning on launching a podcast, and that was mostly like the show development and the guests and all that stuff. I didn't really think about the tech. I spent a weekend before the podcast actually launched to uh, learn the tech (laughs) and set up. Oh, jeez. In hindsight, that was crazy. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I was hooked. So I learned everything that I could about podcasting from then on. And, you know, I was self-hosted with an Amazon uh, S3 server. And I learned the value of a podcast host when I first got my first bill from Amazon. Ah. (laughs) Because the show was actually quite popular. It was new and noteworthy and everything. And we had Canva after us as a sponsor, which... Wow. And that my coaching piece really comes into this and why I decided to work on coaching with podcasters was because I was doing it all myself and I was so overwhelmed that I couldn't take mm-hmm. advantage of that sponsor opportunity with Canva. Oh wow. So and we did we already had a sponsor for the show, but it would have been nice to uh have brought Canva into the fold. <laughs> so that's why I really wanted when I started the editing business, I wanted to throw in the coaching because it's so much more. Uh, there's just so many hats a podcaster has to wear. Mm-hmm. But I got into the editing side after I retired my podcast. So when I retired my podcast, I wondered if people would pay me for these skills that I had learned. <laughs> And I didn't think, I honestly didn't think they would. I didn't think that I could actually get work doing it or a lot of work doing it. It was more, it was just a curiosity. So I just started looking on Upwork okay, to see if that was a thing. And it really, this was back in 2017. So there wasn't. Which is a lifetime ago in podcasting. Wait, right? And it didn't feel like there were a lot of podcasting jobs specifically. Mm-hmm. But I ended up finding one company in Australia who was looking for a consultant and some help writing show notes. Okay. And I applied and I got the job. And it was like a six months process to get their show launched, essentially. Way undercharged. Way Uh undercharged. But it was kind of the the first step into entering into it. Because I wasn't an editor at Mm -hmm. this point. I was just doing the coaching and and writing the show notes. And I helped them hire an editor. Wow, okay. Yeah. And I was like, I could really do that. 
and I didn't think their editor that they hired was really all that great. And I knew what they mm-hmm. were paying them. And I was like, oh, I could do this. So that led to me getting another client. I sent out, like, first of all, on Upwork, I sent out like a hundred proposals for Oof. podcasts in like a weekend. And <laughs> I <laughs> I got one job. <laughs> It's still better than applying to blind applying to a hundred jobs on LinkedIn or ZipRecruiter. So there's that at least. Right, there is. And and after a hundred proposals, I learned how to write a proposal. Let me tell you. Oh, I bet. <laughs> and you were writing these. You weren't just copy pasting. You were actually no, writing them. Up. Yeah. I was right. Yeah, writing. I had some things that I had copied and pasted because I'm a big believer in like things you repeat, make a template yeah. for. But I was personalizing each one. And I got another client for I think fifty dollars an episode. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> How long were the episodes? Oh, about an hour and included show notes and doing oh, some boy. of the social media. But I was just floored that somebody would actually pay me. <laughs> you're, you're totally preaching to the choir here, Carrie, because this is like looking in the mirror from when I started. And I'm like, oh, I, I couldn't charge that much. Or, oh, oh, and then, oh, wait, somebody will pay me. Oh, wait, I can raise my rates because I'm offering a premium product. People are willing to pay top dollar for good work. And, oh, it's it's like I'm a people pleaser by nature. So I have right. a hard time asking people for money. And asking people for more money gets even harder. So I understand the struggle when you first start out of how do you price everything. Right. And I had no clue. I mean, just absolutely no clue. And I didn't even know that there were other podcast editors, really. Like, I thought most of them were in the Philippines <laughs> because my only experience was on Upwork. Right. Uh, and, I, and I had the same thing on Fiverr, so I know exactly what you mean. Right? right? I got another client and then another client. And then I sat down with my um, niece's husband, okay, who is a great, like, spreadsheet. I don't even know what he does. He does something with yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something of yogurt business. I don't know. But we actually sat down and did the math. And he was like, wow, at $50 an episode, you would have to have something like 200 clients to make a, a decent living. And I was like, oh. And then he's like, if you raised your rates to $80 an episode, you could, you know, make the. You know. So we went over all the numbers and I was like, this is crazy. And I was feeling really super confident about my skills. And I was like, oh, I just need to charge more per client. <laughs> right. <laughs> Less clients, higher price. And I think back then it was kind of crazy because there was so much I didn't know about editing and about mm-hmm. audio that I, you know, I was cocky. <laughs> oh, yeah, Absolutely. Same thing with me. I came from working in radio for 15 years, and I said, oh, I know how to edit audio. It's no problem. And I actually pulled some of my early episodes out of my feed because I went back to listen to the audio now a couple years in going, ooh, no, I, I, I don't want that audio out into the world. So it is funny where you start with a little bit of confidence in what you learn as you go. Yes, and then you become less confident. <laughs> and then you start to question <laughs> everything and think everything's yeah. terrible. But. Uh, yeah, so I decided to stop getting lower clients, although I still have that very first independent podcaster client. Mm -hmm. So, and and we did raise rates. So (laughs) it's more than $50 an episode now. Uh, Yes. And he's been like my guinea pig. So I learned a lot doing his show and I am okay with having put in that sweat equity in the beginning Mm -hmm. because it is an entire learning experience of business and even the editing portion for podcasting. So, and I don't fault anybody for starting off low either because, you know, there's some learning that needs to happen. Yep, I have some clients that I have grandfathered in that I've started very early on, and and I did learn some lessons as I was working on their shows. So I completely understand where you're going there. This is interesting to me, Carrie, because I was under the impression that you started with the editing and then got into the coaching, but you actually started with the coaching and then got into the editing. Yes, yes, I know. I think part of that was because I really didn't think that people would pay for that service. Like, to me, editing was, I don't know, kind of fun, kind of. <laughs> like, why would anyone in, want to pass off the editing? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but I quickly came to realize that my thought on editing was not necessarily common. That most people, you know, that's their biggest time sink. And... I kept seeing the editing jobs come up and I was like, there's something to this. Yeah. And then I enjoy, I just enjoy like putting together the 
pace of the interview and the flow of the interview and how people communicate is really fascinating to me. So I really nerd out on that stuff, and I don't think that everybody does. <laughs> I think some people find it tedious, and then there are people like you and me who see sort of an art form to it. Yeah. Like, for me, I enjoy if there's, like, somebody stumbling through a sentence, and if I can get the edit just right and make it sound natural that they said the sentence flawlessly, I say, ooh, that, that's kind of cool that I was able to pull that off. Right. To me, it's like archaeology. <laughs> How so? <laughs> because you are uncovering the layers of, like, dirt and sand and clay to get to the real treasure. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, let me ask you this, because there are a lot of different schools of thought on editing, and there are the people who say you should take out all the ums and uhs and make it flawless, and the, the people at the other end of the spectrum who say, you know what, leave it, don't take any of the ums and uhs out. People say um and ah, and you want to have it sound as natural as possible. Where do you fall in that spectrum? I'm in the middle. Okay. Because obviously not everybody is a great communicator, and we want to portray them with the authority and expertise that they have. But I also think that those ums and ahs, those disfluencies, A, at the podcast editor's conference, I learned from Craig Wheland that those disfluencies, the ums and ahs, can actually help us process information better. Hmm. And B, they can actually add drama to what you're editing. So, for instance, if somebody is talking about something that's very heavy, they're not going to say that cleanly. They're not going to say it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And if they do, it's going to be weird. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's not natural. Yeah. It's not natural. So I think that, you know, somewhere in the middle is where it's the sweet spot. But I think that... Very few people can, like, talk like Joe Rogan right, and get away with it. Joe Rogan has actually been crafting his conversation, his, the, his communication for, like, decades at this point. Mm -hmm. So he knows what he's doing. Most people don't start there. So they need help, you know, to sound as engaging as he does, even with filler. So I don't think that any show truly has no editing. Okay. I think where that editing happens differs. So like with somebody with Joe Rogan, that editing kind of happens in the recording, like on the fly. Yeah. Because he knows how to speak and his guests typically know how to speak. So these are all really good communicators he's dealing with. Right. And now if I could just get him to stop starting his show with seven minutes of commercials right at the beginning, <laughs> we'd be good to go. <laughs> I don't know how to solve that problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see... New podcasters, especially, and some advocates of not editing, look at these other more popular shows and hear those ums and ahs and things and think that those shows aren't edited. And I think Mark Marin's WTF is a good example. There's a lot of editing that goes into that show. <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it. And that's great because that's our job, to make it sound like no editing has been done. But I think people who are new to this don't realize that. There really is an art to the editing, for sure. Um, just out of curiosity, what is, uh, I'll get a little geeky here and ask you, but your DAW, your digital audio workstation, what do you edit on and what's your kind of workflow? So I use Adobe Audition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really dig it. So essentially, and I also use RX. Uh, seven if I need to do any major cleanup. Yep, I use that for the uh, mouth declick and the deep breath, and I just bought the advance to get the dialogue de reverb because I've had an interview, unfortunately, a lot of people on Zoom on laptop microphones lately. <laughs> right, and that dialogue de reverb is nice. However, mm. I um, I don't think you can use it as a plug-in. No, you got to do it separately yeah. and then import it in. Yep. Right, and the same with dialogue isolate, mm -hmm. which is a nice feature of the RX seven. But typically, my clients now record pretty well, so I don't need to do a lot of cleanup in RX-7 standalone. So I import my tracks into a multi-track session, mm -hmm. and I throw on some EQ. I have presets for everybody. Yeah. So <laughs> I throw on some EQ. I do uh, some dynamics compression. Mm -hmm. Well, first I do vocal rider. Okay, yeah. The one from Waves. Yes, yes. Love Vocal Rider. 
And then I put on my Dynamics compression and I'll throw on mount to click. And if I need a de I either, it, it depends on who the speaker is and, mm-hmm. and what their S's are like. I'll either use the built-in de from Audition because I think it does a pretty good job most times. Or I'll use the RX Spectral de Okay. Sometimes if it, you know, the audio needs it, I will throw on multi-band compressor. And I like the Audition's classical. I like a lot of their bass settings. So I usually start with the classical master multi-band compressor and tweak the settings from there. And then, so one of my really quick tricks for dealing with noise or just a little bit of echo or reverb is the essential sound panel in Adobe Audition. And I think it's an underused tool. In the essential sound panel, if you go to repair and select the track, you can just put on a little bit of noise removal that usually takes care of everything. But I can just uh, throw on just a tiny bit of noise removal, usually 0.5 on that panel. And then 0.5 for maybe, you know, reducing the reverb. And then every now and again, if I have uh, somebody that's too muddy, I'll use the clarity setting in the essential sound panel to just kind of roll off the low end using the NPR voice. So I'll throw on a multiband compressor. I've been using at times to the Scarlet has a compressor Mm -hmm. that I kind of like for some clients. So I'll I'll throw that on. Since you are self-taught with the editing, Carrie, let me ask you this, because the thing that I struggle the most with is EQ and mastering and figuring out, you know, what frequencies to boost and which ones to drop. Like, how have you been able to teach yourself and learn about that? Trial and error. And I have, somebody gave me a vocal EQ cheat sheet a couple of years ago that I referred to literally for like an entire year to figure all this out. Mm -hmm. And for me, that really helped. And then Chris Kern explaining a lot of, (laughs) you know, God bless Chris Kern. Oh, yeah. Because he just shares so much information freely. So he did a webinar in the Podcast Editors Club about EQ specifically. Mm -hmm. And it clicked. Like, he went over everything that anybody starting off with EQ could ever want to know. So that was super helpful. I'm just going to go back and watch that because he's. I've seen some of his stuff and it's great. Oh, he's so smart and he's so willing to share. So, yeah, he's a great resource. So after I figured that out, I had a conversation with an engineer from NPR, which was really helpful too. Okay. So finding those resources and just picking their brain because most people are willing to share is, you know, my recommendation for anybody trying to learn anything mm-hmm. about audio. And mastering... So I started using ozone. Yes. Which is super sweet. (laughs) It just gives that body and richness uh, in the final mix that I absolutely love. And and that was fun to learn because I'm a button pusher. So I tried everything. (laughs) So (laughs) that's my other recommendation for learning all this stuff. Push all the buttons. I mean, even if you just, you know, you're not going to break anything because it's not destructive. Mm-hmm. Just push all the buttons. So I came up with my own personal settings for mastering each client's show. Is it true, and this is something that I remember from radio, and people have different schools of thoughts on this, and I, and I want to get in a moment to your Just Busters Facebook group for female podcast editors. Do you find that men and women hear and process audio differently? I think so. I think we communicate differently, and I think we hear differently. What those differences are... I think they're probably, you know, I'm not a scientist, (laughs) so I couldn't couldn't tell you, but uh, men tend to be more confident and action-oriented, and so they're looking for that kind of reflection back to them in, Mm -hmm. in audio. Women tend to be more passive, so they use qualifying words all the time, which men perceive as... I don't want to say weakness, but I want to say less authoritative. And women perceive as, oh, that's a friend. (laughs) But I'd like to change that. Yes. Because what women are doing is trying not to be threatening with their expertise. And I don't know necessarily if it's that's gender related, like who they're trying to be less threatening to. 
Mm-hmm. But I suspect it's just everybody. Like, you don't want to be, I don't know if I can cuss on your show, but. I'll bleep it if you want to. <laughs> you don't want to be a, you, you don't want to be a, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or too aggressive. It's funny you say that because in figuring out where that line is, because look, I'll admit, I am a white man. I have not had to deal with much in my life, and I've probably taken a lot of things for granted just because the only perspective I had was my own. I got married three years ago, and my wife has a corporate job, and she explained what it's like to be a female in corporate culture and how things are perceived differently, and it really opened my eyes to a whole new world of how different the world can be for men and women. And she talked about in her corporate job, aggressive versus bitch. There's, it's, it's sometimes really hard to find that line. It is. And even with other women, to find that line as a woman, like I worry sometimes because I can just, uh, I can be aggressive. <laughs> I know that, but I also know that like tone counts, right? Yes. So finding that line for myself as a woman is difficult. Finding myself, even with my community, finding that line between disseminating the correct information. And disseminating the correct information and not coming off as a know-it-all or a <laughs> there's no other way. <laughs> there's no other way to state that. Now, if I were aggressive like that in a group of male podcast editors, it's easier to find that line, right? Mm-hmm. For some reason, it's just because they'll you come off as confident okay, and that you know what you're talking about. With women, I think it's a little bit different. And that may be um, – I don't know if it's audio or podcasting. So – I think that women in podcasting is just a little bit of a different beast. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can articulate it very well, but so these are women who use their voices all the time and are always thinking about their voices Mm -hmm. and always thinking about communication. So there's kind of that extra layer there of interpretation. Okay. I don't know. I, you know, I haven't fully fleshed out this, but this is something I've been thinking about lately. Well, this actually plays into my next question, which is about the Just Busters Facebook group. So you and I are both in this podcast editors club on Facebook, which has been a tremendous resource. But you and some other podcast editors came up with this idea of a female only group to deal with maybe some issues that are unique to your perspective. Right. So we were at the podcast editors club meetup at Podcast Movement in Philadelphia, and Jennifer Longworth really took the lead on this. I don't know what exactly precipitated it, but there were, I think, some things that came up. I know that in Podcast Editors Club, I've had some dudes slide into my DMs, (laughs) (laughs) which is not the purpose of that group at all. No, no, no. So I think that we just all have these experiences. I love, and I want to say, I love the Podcast Editors Club. Fabulous. I love Steve Stewart. Mm -hmm. I love Mark Deal. Fabulous dudes. However, we were just feeling, I don't know, we were uh, feeling frustrated and really starting to understand that we maybe communicate audio a little bit differently. So like a lot of times I'll refer to something in audio is a thingy. (laughs) (laughs) Technical term, yeah. Yeah, the technical term. And so that's not always received well, or that doesn't always make me look well. And a lot of women in these technical fields have problems asking questions, which I believe they should ask, and getting them answered without any kind of judgment without being told it's stupid or they should know Mm. or something like that. And that's not to say that necessarily happens, right? That's to say that's how a woman feels and what prevents them from asking questions they should be asking. So we wanted to create a space where we could come in and talk about audio in the way we communicate using the words we use, like thingy, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, without having to really worry about any judgment and really to support each other. And Jennifer Longworth, you know, said, we should do this. And it was Emily Prokop and Alicia Barrett who were with Mm us. And we were all like, yeah, that would be great. And Jennifer, when Jennifer Longworth gets a hair... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she just goes for it. Let me tell you. Yep. She's like, I'm just doing it right now. Will you be an administrator? 
And we were all like, yeah. And so we signed up right then and there. And that's how it was born. (laughs) And now we've grown to over 600 members. And we do a lot of education. So right now we're doing a speaker series where we're having people come into the group and doing like webinars on certain topics. We just had a speaker, Rebecca Kleinberger, who was the woman who did the TED Talk about why you hate the sound of your voice. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we just had her come in and had the most fascinating conversation about voices Mm -hmm. and learned that very much uh, your voice is tied to your hormones. Really? Yes. And that's why it changes. That's why it changes daily. That's why it changes monthly. That's why it changes over time. And that your voice box is actually made up of reproductive tissue. Wow. Okay. Right? (laughs) So that blew my mind. And that was phenomenal. And we've just had some great speakers come in. And we've been doing this. So I started planning this before the coronavirus thing. The coronavirus thingy? Yeah, the coronavirus thingy. (laughs) Yeah. And it just so happened that the series started when everything got locked down. So that was a happy accident because now everybody had time to actually speak. <laughs> so. And tell me about the name Just Busters because I love the concept behind the name here. So it's called Just Busters because women use qualifying words like just. I'm just a mom. I'm just a podcast editor. I'm just a doctor. They use the word just to make themselves appear less threatening. Mm. And that actually diminishes their authority and expertise. And as editors, this is one of the conversations that we've had a lot before starting this group between the female podcast editors, is the amount of just we take out of our female clients' episodes huh. or female guests' interviews is the word just. And if you have an awareness, because I do this for men too, Mm -hmm. some men who do use these qualifying terms. So I will take them out as an editor because it's not you're just this amazing person. (laughs) You're this amazing person and you should own that. In hearing a previous podcast you've done where you've explained the genesis behind Just Busters, I've kept that in mind as I've edited podcasts, and I've very quickly deleted almost every just of every guest I've edited on a podcast, thanks to you and you explaining this whole idea. Well, I'm so glad, and I think that's one of the things that we have done as a group and our members have done extremely well is to bring that issue to light. Mm -hmm. Because once you have that awareness, it changes the way you're hearing things now. And then you realize how much you say just. Like, even though I'm, like, the co-founder of Just Busters, I still have to delete just out of everything. (laughs) When I type an email, editing myself on my podcast, I still have to delete that word. I'm still guilty of it. I'm aware of it now, though. That's the difference. I do want to ask you, before we wrap up, about your coaching business and how all that is set up. But I also want to ask you, You mentioned coronavirus a minute ago, and I feel like it's worth asking what effect you've seen on podcasting with coronavirus, because there are a number of conflicting statistics out there. I'm curious what you've seen in both in terms of podcasting in general and anything that's come to you in terms of clients that you've been coaching or editing. So my coaching business, I work with podcasters and with podcast editors. Okay. For podcasters... A lot of the coaching is around, I would almost say mindset, even though we're talking about marketing, downloads, sponsorships, all these things are really come down to just thinking about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So thinking about it in terms of the end user, which would be the listener. So how do you make that content really about the listener and not about you. (laughs) Right. That's a big shift for people, I think, because especially, you know, podcasters, we're doing this thing. We have a little bit of an ego. That's okay. (laughs) We can forget about who we're doing this for and why. So Mm -hmm, that's a lot mm -hmm. of what I do about coaching around. But I also do the very practical things like Does everybody know you're a podcaster? That drives me crazy. Like, if you don't have your podcast links on your social media, if your cousin doesn't know you're a podcaster, 
you need to fix that. Like, everybody should know. And fortunately, we are getting to a point where your cousin is going to know what a podcast is. But even if, they, even if they're still part of that small percentage that doesn't know what podcasting is, at least they should know that you're doing it. Right. They should know that you're doing this mysterious thing, right? <laughs> yeah, my mother knows I have a podcast. She doesn't listen. She doesn't quite understand what it is, but she knows I have a podcast and she'll tell people I have a podcast, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> my, I just got my folks uh, an Amazon Alexa, so at least even if they can't figure out the Apple Podcast app on their iPhone, at least they can have Alexa play my podcast and they can hear it. <laughs> right? Hopefully Alexa understands what they're saying because she never understands what I say. So I just get the wrong <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so, uh, and with podcast editors, I do a lot of coaching around the technical side, so the audio side. And I work a lot with women hmm. about the technical side because let me tell you, the language of audio is not very friendly. <laughs> it's not like I tried to explain to somebody what a bus was yesterday. Uh, and okay. even I had a hard time with that. I'm like, you know, it's like taking each track and sending them to the beach before they go to the bar, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> Never heard it explained that way, but that actually makes a lot of sense. Right. right. Well, for me, like when I hear the word bus, I'm like, you're literally like putting all these tracks on a bus and sending them somewhere to like hang out. <laughs> <laughs> so the language we use in audio is really weird. And so the first thing I give every coaching client, every editor, is a vocabulary sheet that explains all these words like threshold and ratio and attack and in compression in plain language. Which is the hardest part for me. What's always been the hardest part for me to understand is compression and attack and release and all those things. So I love that oh. you do that. Yeah, and my metaphor for compression is, remember when you were a kid and you got out the Play-Doh ah. and you wanted to make a rope? <laughs> oh my God, that's brilliant. Because that's what it is, essentially. And look, it took me years to even figure out what compression was. Like, that was mm -hmm. like one of the last things. And so I think in audio, we don't make things necessarily easy for just anybody to pick up. I start with the language piece. And once you get that, you can start really understanding what all the buttons and knobs do. And after that, once you understand that, you can pretty much start figuring things out. It's a matter of just kind of grasping the basic concepts. And then once you have that, you can sort of do trial and error and play with all the bells and whistles. Right. Cause that, and then also I, I tell the people I coach, like, I can sit here and tell you all this, but until you do it, it's not going to make a ton of sense. No, there's no way you can learn this without having hands-on and doing it. No, yeah, go in there, push all the buttons, make... And that's another thing I have to do is I have to tell people, like, don't be afraid to make a mistake, to push the buttons and get it wrong. Yeah. Because they're so terrified. I'm like, you're working non-destructively. Or, you know, and if you're so worried, sit down and make a dummy recording and then mm -hmm. use that and destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I also do the business side training with editors because I have a background or have always been really good at customer service. Mm -hmm. So that's something. And now I'm, I feel like I've gotten into like the digital content marketing space where I've done a lot sure. of digital content marketing for local, like a lot of given them a lot of resources for our local businesses. So we cover all that. Being a super nerd, I have to understand how all these parts work together. Yeah. And so I'm just passing all of that that I learn on to people. And my mentor was Elsie Escobar. So mm -hmm. <laughs> she really made things click. You know, it all starts with that clarity. So that's basically what I'm doing. And then in terms of having COVID-19 affect my business and my clients, I have had a lot of conversations with clients about the future. What happens? They can no longer afford my services. Yeah. So those are tough conversations to have. Like, obviously, mm -hmm. I still need to get paid. So I have done a lot of mitigation plans with clients and figured out ways where they could either keep my services by, you know, delaying payments or, like, setting up payment plans, or what they would do if they couldn't afford me at all. And okay. how do they keep from pod fading? Because my hope is that if they can't afford me for a little while, they'll come back. You know, I love my clients. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to go anywhere. Right. So 
I have given them strategies to still put out content in a manageable way, whether it's through shorter episodes or reducing the frequency of episodes, rebroadcasting episodes, so things, putting together clip shows, things like that, that they can do easily themselves without a lot of skills. I think that's just a credit to you and your business savvy too, Kara, to think that, okay, well, maybe they can't afford to pay me right now, but how can I keep them involved? How can I keep them engaged so that, number one, they can continue podcasting, but number two, when they're able to, when things come back, they're able to bring you back into the fold. Well, thank you. You know, it's my job to make their life easier. That's what they're paying for now. Right. And it is much cheaper for me to bring a client back in the fold than it is to onboard a new client. (laughs) So. Right, because then you're starting from scratch and you're having to teach them all these things from the jump. Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah, I'm having to train them. <laughs> and some of these clients, I put a lot of work into training them to do things exactly how I wanted them to do. So, <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning, Carrie. We're recording this on uh, Tuesday morning, May 5th, so happy Cinco de Mayo, even though we can't really go to any bars and celebrate. We can still have tacos. <laughs> Oh, oh, my wife and I are doing Taco Tuesday tonight. Absolutely. It's ready to go. (laughs) Before I let you go, if people want to get a hold of you for your editing services, your coaching services, what are the best ways to find you? So you can find it all on yayapodcasting.com. And you can use, I have a free podcast audits uh, or a free editing audit. So if you want me to review your podcast marketing, your podcast content, your podcast sound, your editing sound, your editing business. I am. I will give you a quick audit and tell you what needs, what is working, and what needs help. So, and give you a, a strategy or two for that. Love that. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Love what you're doing in the world of podcasting for women and for the business as a whole. It's always great to talk with you. And uh, maybe if I don't see you in Texas over the summer, it could be the fall, could be next year. Look forward to seeing you in person again. Oh, same here, John. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate this. All right. Take care, Carrie. Thanks for listening to the Jag Show podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe in Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes are published every Tuesday and Friday morning. For help with your podcast, find JAG on social media at JAG in Detroit or on the web at jagindetroit.com.